All right. Hi, I'm Harold Bell, and this is the Legends of Inside Sports and the Way We Were. On today's show, we're going to be visiting uh, with an old friend. My special guest is a native Washingtonian and a product of the D.C. public school system. He is a 1957 graduate of Spangarn High School. He was an outstanding track and field athlete in his final year at Spangarn. He played football. His late brother, Maurice, was also an outstanding athlete at Spangarn High School uh, during those years while he was trying to get his act together. I'm talking about my special, co my special guest this morning. One of his coaches uh, was the famous and legendary Dave Brown, who turned many of our lives around. He attended Flagstone University in Oklahoma in 1957 with the help of Coach Brown and Valley Birdsong, former Armstrong High School track athlete. At the end of his college education in 1973, he went on to get his master's degree from the University of District of Columbia and another degree from the University of Southern Cal in LA as an educator for public management. And in 1973, he maintained a 4.0 average, specializing in urban affairs. He began coaching local track and field athletes during the summer of 1960-65 and sent nine athletes on track scholarships out to California in 1964-65. He considers this to be one of his major accomplishments in his career. He spent five years in Ethiopia where he arranged track scholarships for Ethiopian athletes, built buildings to benefit local schools, institutions, served on the American Community School Board, and coached basketball. He engulfed himself in the Ethiopian community and culture that he continues to maintain relationship in that community to this day. He helped prepare Ethiopia for the Mexico Olympics and returned from Ethiopia and ended up at the U.S. Department of Agriculture as a political appointee of President Jimmy Carter. And it was here he began a lifelong journey as a champion and advocate of civil and human rights for government employees. At the United States Department of Agriculture in 1994, he became president of the USDA Coalition of Minority Employees and was later awarded the title of Emeritus from the organization. He has served for almost a quarter of a century the organization has received national recognition for its advocacy for minority farmers, uh, farmers, especially black farmers, and the U.S. Department of Agriculture employees. I would like to welcome uh, to the Legends of Inside Sport, who is a legend himself, uh, my friend, Mr. Lawrence Lucas. How you doing, Lawrence? That's good morning, and thanks for having me on this morning. Oh, man, thanks for uh, taking the time out. Uh, to be here, man. Uh, this has been a long overdue, you know. It's a uh, there are not many of us, man, who really uh, come out of the D.C. public school system, especially Spingarn, who have spent almost our entire and adult lives in the war zones of uh, fighting for others, man. So I take my hat off to you, man, because. Uh, I thought I was out there by myself, but <laughs> <laughs> but after reading all that you've been through, man, it has been fantastic, man, uh, in the service for others. Lawrence, what impacted you most during your childhood that made you uh, the person that you are today? Well, what happened uh, during my childhood, I came in contact with uh, my parents uh, my father was a Cardoza uh, athlete. They called him Smack Lucas. I found out more about that after I got in high school and ran into all the coaches that played football with him at Cardoza. But uh, during the summer, we would go and spend time in Virginia. And uh, uh, that was the first time I came in contact with the word nigger. And uh, uh, from that that experience of not being able to uh, sit downstairs in the theater and and I was we were relegated to sleep, uh, sitting in the balcony and uh, having this experience 
exposure at a drive-in movie where uh, that kind of profanity was I was exposed to. I think it really turned my life around uh, because uh, I think that was the first major decision that I made in civil rights. I told my grandmother that uh, I did not want to return to that theater because I didn't feel as though I had to sit in the balcony. And I think that was a turning point in my life. And I didn't realize that until much earlier in my career as a civil rights advocate, that uh, that was the turning point. And then, of course, uh, going to Spingarn High School and and going to Brown Junior High School, Langley Junior High School, uh, uh, Junior High School, Brown Elementary School, and Lovejoy. So I've given you somewhat of a history of my pattern all the way through uh, the educational process. But it was the people that I came in contact with, like Spotswood Bowling, who you know very well, mm -hmm. who passed away in 1990. Uh, <clears throat> so who, um, you know, the Sharp versus Bowling case. Mm -hmm. And uh, and those things had an impact. And uh, when I was going to Langley back in, I think it was 19... Uh, 65, I think it was, and I was called into the office, uh, not called to the office, but uh, uh, our classes stopped, and we all went back to our class, and that, that was the passage of the desegregation uh, act, uh, which Bowling versus Sharp and okay. Spotswood uh, played sports with us, and, and I think that he gained something from sports as being uh, what determined him to civil rights and his parents uh, fighting for our rights and we didn't even know uh, spots where was even involved in civil rights at all. Mm -hmm. So uh, we've had uh, careers that have taken us from uh, high school, uh, our childhood, and then we end, end up in a school such as Spingarn High mm -hmm. School. And then have the kind of coaches like uh, like uh, Hammond, Hill, uh, McNair, mm -hmm. and uh, especially Coach Brown, who made an impact in my life. In fact, he straightened me out. Uh, Harold, I had somewhat the same kind of experience. Uh, I think that you had, uh, I did something wrong, and I had to go to Coach Brown and apologize for it and ask him to, because uh, he put me off the track team. And mm -hmm. the following year, I became captain of the track team. Uh, he also was involved with getting me a track scholarship to Langston yeah. University along with Valley Birdsong. Mm -hmm. So um, these, th 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 it's strange how we come through life. And all of a sudden, uh, I end up uh, going to Langston University, coming home, mm -hmm. feeling obligated to do something for other athletes that uh, Coach Brown did for me, and knowing the importance of seeing other young men to go to college. In fact, when uh, when I went to Langston, I, I told uh, uh, Coach, uh, the athletic director and track coach, uh, Inman Bro, that I didn't want to go to Langston all by myself, although we had uh, some spin gone and a Hong Kong athlete there. So I talked them into giving uh, Andrew Johnson a, a basketball scholarship. Mm -hmm. And, and and these people that you know, and sometimes you probably don't know, you know, if we didn't talk to each other, uh, we wouldn't have known about these things. But uh, I think that was a turning point in my life. <clears throat> and uh, being attached to that kind of environment where people cared about each other. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that what we learned from Spingarn and our athletic experience, that uh, working together as a team, working together to help others, uh, working together to promote others, others' lives as well as your own and your families, I think was a turning point for me. And as I grew uh, and started having all these experiences and going to the Army Map Service and uh, getting an advanced education, uh, which you, you mentioned already, so we don't have to talk about that. Well, let me uh, let me kind of summarize here because you uh, you have. Uh touched on some very important things uh, that started you on this journey. And similar to mine, I mean, we came out of a, 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 a school environment, man. Not only did the coaches care about us, but we had an outstanding staff of teachers. And then the principal, Dr. Purvis Williams, like nobody 
that I've ever encountered, you know, uh, Miss Duncan and Mr. Davis, man, all those wow. people had a uh, great and uh, made great impressions on us. And another thing that you had going for you too, you mentioned earlier, but your dad Smack. We all knew Smack Lucas. I mean, the athletes knew him because he was a, he was a part of the school environment. He was a part of the recreation a uh, playground environment. He was just like a uh, uh, Doc Payne's father, Cookie, uh, Mr. Payne. They, we yeah, knew them, you know. They were they they came down to the field uh, where we were practicing and be, and like it, it was a big family, you know. It was really a family, man. People, we really cared about each other, even though some of us were knuckleheads like I was. But we had people to really influence us in spots who were bowling. A lot of folks don't really understand uh, his importance in the civil rights movement. He was. A guy that was my teammate us on the basketball team at Spang Honor. And I really didn't know <laughs> that Spotswood was an important part of the Brown versus Board of Education. He was the main plaintiff uh, in, in Washington, D.C. It was Bowling versus the Board of Ed Shop. Education. That's right, Bowling Shop. So, man, we, we come out of an of a environment, man, that we should be proud of. And here we are. On this day, April 4th, where it marks the 50th anniversary of, of uh, losing our, our Prince of Peace, who was assassinated, Dr. Martin Luther King, you know? So this is, this is, this is fantastic. This was not something that we really planned, but here we are on April 4th. I know exactly where I was on April 4th, 1968. I was standing on the corner of 9th and U with my co-worker, Wooly Wood, as, as a roving leader. So, man, this is a, a teaching moment, not only uh, for you and me, but for the, the people who are going to see this program, how you got started on this journey and the impact that you have had, Lawrence. Yeah, uh, for example, uh, my life is uh, it's a fantastic that I woke up this morning and all the news was covering uh, the death of uh, the 50th anniversary of the assassination of Dr. King. Well, in 1963, I was on the mall. Uh, I took my son, uh, my one son at the time, put him on my shoulder and we couldn't... Uh, and we came all the way from Anacostia. Uh, a lot of that journey was, uh, we walked there. And um, I have to say that uh, Dr. King uh, made such an impression with that I had a dream speech and, and just being in that audience in 1963 on the mall, uh, that set a, a trend and a pattern and a, a, a career that uh, I did not know when I was out there. But eventually I realized that uh, I had to make a difference in some other people's lives. And I, I knew that uh, track and field was one and the other was uh, uh, coaching and helping athletes to get scholarships which I did uh, both uh, in Ethiopia as well as in uh, Washington, Montreal, and Nuria. But the most important thing is that it plummeted me into a civil rights career that, uh, that I'm still doing uh, to this day. We can talk more about that later on, but uh, it's just, uh, uh, Harold, it's just interesting to see that uh, many of our colleagues, many of the, our fellow athletes, have uh, Nucci Green, uh, these guys, uh, many of the athletes, which you know some of their names better than me because you've kept up with them uh, uh, as part of your show and part of your lifestyle. And uh, it's just fantastic that we've come out of a, out of a community uh, which uh, was um, because of athletics and because of wonderful people and teachers and principals That's and right. coaches. And uh, then we're plummeted into the struggle of life and now working and raising a family. We find other things that we, we had to do in order to make our lives complete. You in sports, you uh, talking about things that people didn't want to hear. Uh, I know the plight. And I've heard about your struggle uh, in trying to be different and trying
trying to be yourself and trying to help others, other athletes, uh, exposing other athletes uh, and helping other athletes at the same time. Um, we, we have gone down uh, two different paths, but we were doing the same thing for people that we thought that we should do for. And uh, I can't say uh, I commend you uh, because I know what you've been through over the years uh, for speaking out. I, too, have uh, suffered the same pain, the same agony, because people uh, feel as though you have to go along to get along mm -hmm. in, in this world instead of do what is the right thing for people. Mm -hmm. You know, Lawrence, uh, uh, this uh, people... I don't call this an anniversary when it comes to Dr. Martin Luther King. It, I'm still mourning. You know, you know, anniversary is something that you celebrate. I don't celebrate his death. I tell people at any time, you know, that I'm still in mourning. And one of the, the topics of uh, a recent YouTube uh, program that I just got through doing, that I found um, a program on Inside Sports in 1988. And, and the title of that program was this. The, the dream of Dr. Martin Luther King, is it alive or is it dead? And, and I'm looking at, you know, here, 50 years later, man, the progress made by black folks has been almost zero. You know, and this man sacrificed his life. We're talking about the great teachers that we had at Spangon, the great principals. You know, I, under, I understood that late how important they were to me. Like I said, I was a knucklehead. I took time out, and I don't, I don't think you were there, but I took time out to honor Dr. Williams, Officer Dixon, who played uh, also an important role in our lives. You know, I honored them at, at Mingles, at uh, our, our friend uh, Bill Lindsay's restaurant. I took time out to honor them because I was in a, in a position. I was a Nike representative. I had my own radio show. I had great sponsors. So I said, man, I need to thank these people because I am here because of them. And I know you feel that exact same way. And it hurt me so to see Spingon closed down. Our history closed down, man. Our history has been oppressed. They're trying to wipe our history out, man. And that is something that we should never forget and we should never let our kids forget, Lawrence. Many of the bad experiences that we have in life, uh, we use them as a stepping stone to do better things for our families and better things for for uh, our friends, our colleagues, and others. And at the same time, we're striving to make uh, Washington, D.C. a better place. Uh, and the most important thing is to make our country a better place, a better place for That's all right. of us. And I think that as we struggle with this whole issue of civil rights, I never thought that when I became president of the U.S. Department of Agriculture Coalition of Minority Employees back in 1994, that I would be, uh, after all these years, that uh, I would still be in the same struggle that I was mm. in in 1994, when the first black secretary of agriculture, Mike Espy, uh, was appointed by Bill Clinton. And here we are, uh, decades later, mm -hmm. fighting the same uh, struggle uh, with those in power in high places in Washington. And knowing that these people that have authority, that have influence, would uh, take a back step to the gains that were made in the 50s and the 60s out of the struggle and the pain and suffering and the loss of lives, that we are now still in the same struggle mm -hmm. and with the same kind of goals that we had then is to turn around this country and have everybody treated equally, everybody treated fairly. And that is not happening in this country. And I'm sorry to say that some of our leaders, our so-called leaders, mm -hmm. and organizations that are supposed to be representing us have, have uh, taken a step back from the struggle for the strangest kind of reasons. So it, you need to have people uh, like yourself. 
you need to have uh, young people uh, coming online, uh, stepping up and marching down the streets of this country to demand that if you, if my parents are not willing to do something about gun control, I'm willing to go do what my parents would not do, what my uncle and my cousins and my older brother would not do. So we're in a struggle uh, against a lot of evil things coming out of Washington. I've never seen mm. such strife. I've never seen so much indifference mm -hmm. uh, uh, politically in this country as I've seen uh, now. And I wonder just why, just why we have to go through this struggle and continue this struggle, but the struggle we must as individuals to make sure that uh, we have a better country. Mm -hmm. And I think that can be done by us contributing and demanding from our politicians, demanding from our leaders, demanding from people who claim they, they have our best interests in mind, hold them accountable for what they do and while they're in office. That's not happening across the board. So you have people isolated like uh, the Coalition of Minority Employees and other groups, mm -hmm. uh, No Fear, fighting for the struggle of women. Uh, you are struggling for the rights for athletes to be able to uh, earn a decent salary while the uh, while the associations like the uh, NAA, uh, the, uh, the uh, National uh, uh, Collegiate uh, uh, Group, uh, NC2A, for example, they, they control the destiny of young people while they go and benefit financially but yet and still these young people coming out of our communities are still suffering and continue to suffer because of the laws and the policies that and the edicts that they put out to control them and therefore having negative impact on them and their families you know exactly what i'm talking about yeah, yeah you know uh, lawrence i i was just thinking earlier you said something about you never thought that you was you know, here 30, 50 years later, man, that we're still in the same struggle. I had no clue, Lawrence, that when I went to uh, Winston-Salem uh, State and Winston-Salem, North Carolina, which saved my life going down in Big House Games, I owe him so much, and Coach Brown. But I never thought that in 1960, I am in the middle of the Civil Rights Movement because 30 miles down the road, four young men from North Carolina A&T decided to say enough was enough. And they took a journey on going to the Woolworth Five and Dime and sitting in at the lunch counter. And that movement moved from 30 miles down the road up to Winston-Salem. And I, I and my teammates and I, we got involved against our coaches' uh, <laughs> wishes not to get involved. But it was that 1960, and here we are in 2018, and we are fighting the same battles, man, the same exact battles. How can, Lawrence, I want you to ask me that, answer me like this. How can we ever, how can there ever be an even playing field when a black man in 2018 is still making half of what a white man uh, earns? How can... Uh, the definition of success in America is, is the dollar bill. And we are never going to have an equal opportunity to gain the things that we need to gain if they keep us out of the financial culture that they're in. They make double the salary of a, of a, of a black man today. So I'm saying, how can we sit back and say that we are making progress, man, and, and progress is based in America on a dollar bill? that uh, we have not gained and kept up with uh, the lifestyle, the economic uh, comparison of blacks compared to whites, have not, during even the Obama administration, uh, recent report 2015 and 16, indicate that we have lost ground. That's right. As I have been fighting for the black farmers, we have seen a redistribution of wealth in this country. If you own land, you have wealth, you have worth. What they've done over the decades through government programs and policy, they have taken the land from black people in this country, minorities, 
Native Americans, and even women, for that example. But the most important thing in the case of black folks, we've lost millions of acres over the decades because of systematic discrimination by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, which they call the last plantation, and it should be because that's what it is. And to this day, and to this day, with all the all the money that the taxpayers have put out to fix the racial divide and the discrimination and the dysfunctional civil rights process at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, black farmers are still not getting their cases processed the way white farmers are. Employees at the U.S. Department of Agriculture, including women, are being abused and discriminated against. So you have in this country a culture of indifference and a culture of bigotry and a culture uh, that goes beyond anyone's imagination that in this day and time, women, when they come to work, have to come to work and experience harassment, intimidation, assaults, rape, and other kinds of intimidation. And that is going on in this country. While we, while our leaders and our politicians in Washington sit back and do nothing. And for that matter, until recently at PBS, we've seen over the last 10 or 12 years since the Clinton administration, where you had the media who could have played a major role in exposing this, but yet still remain silent. And now they have turned their eyes back on this problem because women have been abused. But the same abuse that women, all women have been receiving, black folks have been receiving for generations That's and right. generations, and it looks like generations to come, sorry to say. Yeah. You know, Lawrence, we're talking to uh, Lawrence Lucas. You can see him right over my shoulder, the young man back there in the, the blue shirt and tie right below Muhammad Ali's picture on my message board. He's been my special guest on the Legends of Inside Sports. And I tell you, uh, man, time sure flies, man, when you got information. But, Brother Lawrence, we're going to have to have you back because we want to continue this conversation about the great things that you're doing, man, as it relates to uh, uh, minorities, farmers, and women, that you are in the, in the thick of the battle, man. And I... I take my hat off to you, man, because I know how difficult it is to be different and stand up, man, for what you believe in. And uh, like I said, we got a, it's still an uphill battle, but it looks like these young folks, man, are getting on board now. And as you know, we've been in the war zone with young people for, for decades, man. So this is nothing new to me. Our kids' blood have been flowing in the street for decades. And now that it has of course, moved on to the suburbs. Now we have a platform for every for every kid, both young, black, white, Hispanic. Everybody has a platform. So, Brother Lawrence, you got the last word, and I'm looking forward to uh, continuing this conversation with you. Well, I want to say thank you for having me on, and I'll be more than glad to, to return to your show at, a, at another time and another date uh, to continue talking about the struggles that uh, we uh, that, uh, that have to be made and the sacrifices that have to be made for not only our lives but uh, to make this country the country that it should be and must be. Right. Thank you very much for having me on. Well, man, it's been my pleasure, and I just want everybody to know that's going to be it for this segment of the Legends of Inside Sports, my special guest, uh, uh, my brother Lawrence Lucas, uh, and looking forward uh, to having him back. And just remember, as I always say, that every black face you see is not your brother, and every white face you see is not your enemy. Until next time, I'm Harold Bell, and you can color me gone.